with the first pick in the 2019 NBA Draft, the New Orleans Pelicans select Zion Williamson from Duke Iguodala. Oh, oh, blocked by James. They do have a timeout. Decide not to use it. Curry way down to bang, bang. How's it going, everyone? Welcome back to the Shot Clock Podcast. My name is Nathan Shaw. Today I'm joined by Alex Hollingsworth from none other than the Lakers Central Podcast, one of the best podcasts out there right now uh, about the Lakers. But uh, Alex has been doing this for how, how long have you been doing it for, Alex? Yeah, uh, three years now, man. Three years? Has there. Because I've always, so I've been doing my podcast for about four months. Has there ever been a time where you're kind of like, man, this is really struggling a lot more than I thought it would? Uh, do I really want to go on with this? Have you ever had doubts in yourself? Not really doubts, but it's definitely, it's harder than I think people think. They think you can just grab a mic and talk, but it's, it's not that simple. <laughs> not if you want to be good at it. <laughs> Yeah, one of the things I've noticed is uh, I, I've, I'll watch like podcasting videos every now and then, podcasting tips, and these guys would be like, anybody can start a podcast. It, the sad reality is anybody can start one, but not everyone can do one. You know, it's like not everyone has the right right mindset to do one because it's a lot of work, especially when you're balancing between marketing and actually being able to go in front of the mic because you could be good at my, uh, marketing, but you cannot be good at talking on the mic or vice versa. So it's kind of your experience with uh, promoting your podcast and uh, everything that goes into that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, when I started it and even now, man, I mean, social media like that, you know, social media has made it easier to market pretty much anything. So you don't need a huge marketing budget. You can go on there and you promote it. Right. And so I'm a Lakers fan, Lakers based podcast and the Lakers naturally get a lot of attention. So, um, like I would constantly post things about the Lakers, post my podcast, post whatever I was doing with, with the podcast and slowly, but surely started to gather more and more followers and then more and more listeners. Um, and before I knew it, I was picking up, you know, hundreds of followers every month and, and my downloads were shooting up and it was crazy. Yeah. I've been, you're one of the longest Twitter accounts based on Lakers that I followed. I remember as soon as I got Twitter, because I got Twitter around like a year ago is when I got serious into it. And you were one of the first accounts I followed, and that's how I discovered you. But I, I feel like um, one thing I want to ask is how did you become a Lakers fan? Because you're from the East Coast out in Maryland, so yep. it's not very common when you're in that area to be a Lakers fan. So how originally did you start? Yeah, man. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big Shaq fan. Um, and so like I was a big Shaq fan when he was at LSU. And when Shaq got drafted, went to Orlando, I was actually a fan. And so, like, um, my very first NBA jersey was a Shaq champion Orlando jersey. And my younger brother had a Penny Hardaway jersey. And then when Shaq went to L.A., I went with him. And they happened to trade for Kobe's draft rights that same summer. And um, basically, that's how it happened. Like, I, I've never been a fan of, the back then, the Bullets, but now the Wizards. Um, you know, so it was basically, I was a Shaq fan. I like I loved him when he was in Orlando, and then when he went to LA, it was like, oh, this this feels right. So I've been a Lakers fan ever since. Yeah, one of the things I've noticed personally on my own Lakers experiences, it was like we talked about this already before, but for uh, those listening, it was about seventh grade years when I got big into the NBA scene and really enjoyed watching basketball. I remember the Lakers was my first team, and I was like, I really like this. You know, they had a lot of young guys back then. I think. It was when Lonzo got drafted, so I became a big fan. But I was more of a fan of Kuzma, and it was people would always be like, once LeBron signed, they're like, "Oh, you're only a fan of LeBron. You're only a fan of LeBron, and that's why you like the Lakers." N never was a fan of LeBron before he came there. I was always just like, "He's definitely coming." Because I remember talking that February, I was like, "He's coming to the Lakers. There's no way. He's the Cavs aren't good enough for him want to stay there. He's going to come to the Lakers for media." But um, a little bit about that LeBron signing that went down. What? When you first, that July 1st at like 3 p.m. our time, what was your first reaction of him signing there? I was at a friend's cookout, man, and like, you know, I know there were rumors LeBron was flirting with the Lakers and, and maybe they had talked and um, I was sitting at the, the dining room table and 
one of the girls there, she said, LeBron signed with the Lakers. And I was like, no, he didn't. And she was like, yeah, he did. And then we turned to ESPN and sure enough, it's like on the screen, the, the clutch press release. And I lost it. So like before then, I was never a LeBron fan. I always respected his game. He's one of the greatest players of all time. But I wasn't a LeBron fan. But I wasn't one of those people that was like hating on him just for the sake of hating on him. So like at that moment, I went and like hugged one of my one of my friends and I was like losing it. Like I, I kept screaming, we're back, we're back. Like we had been bad for like damn near a decade. And I lost it, man. And it's been crazy ever since. Yeah, I remember the signing. I was at a Logic concert and uh, up in Indianapolis. And I remember hearing, I go on Twitter and I check through, I'm scrolling. And I kept refreshing because I was like, this got to be the day one of these free agents signed. Because who else they have in that? Oh, man, I can't remember who else they have oh, in that. Oh, that, uh, that summer? Yeah, that summer. And the, I remember the free agent class uh, was, was pretty good. It was supposed to be him and Paul George that summer. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's what it was supposed to be. And then Paul George flew back to Oklahoma City and, and signed with them. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, I remember because I was like, it's got to be Paul George or LeBron. And I remember Paul George kept releasing the uh, his little documentary series he did right. on YouTube. And I was like, oh, he's got to be signed with the Lakers. And then uh, I checked Twitter. It says LeBron James signed under a four-year, like $136 million deal. And I was, I'm in the middle of the concert row, and I, was, I freaked out. I was screaming, oh, my God, oh, my God. I was like, no way, we just got LeBron. I was like, what the heck? But, uh, yeah, you mentioned the Paul George uh, signing with Oklahoma. I, I kind of want to talk about this. I've always wondered, do you think he would have been a good fit with LeBron? Yes. I think he would have been um, as perfect a wingman as LeBron's ever had. I, I don't know if he would have been better than Anthony Davis because I think Anthony Davis seems like he's just perfect for LeBron. I actually think people are probably going to hate that I say this, but I actually think he may have been a better wingman than Dwayne Wade. Not, not, not that he's better than Dwayne Wade, but that Paul George coming off screen, shooting threes, six, nine playing defense. I mean, the dude can play, man. You know, like I don't like, I wish he would have signed with us, but he, he can play. So, and not only had he signed with us, then there was still an opportunity for us to still trade the young core for Anthony Davis. So you think about it, we could have potentially had LeBron, Paul George, and Anthony Davis. That's 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 pretty scary. Well, even if you didn't trade AD, it could have been – or if you didn't trade for AD, let's say LeBron's like, All right, I got my co-superstar. Let me keep this bench rotation yeah. slash this supportive young core with me. Because you got Lonzo, Kuzma, and Ingram. And Kuzma was a different breed until kind of AD signed. But I think a lot of it's been injury – so you got to think, Kuzma, in, even Ingram with Paul George and LeBron would have been insane because Ingram's just a great shot creator. But somewhere down the line, I do expect to trade out of that because Ingram just was so inconsistent that uh, last year he had with LeBron. It was just hard to watch. And then the blood cottage, uh, cottage you kind of yeah. assumed that there was going to be a trade going down eventually. But um, So we bring up the AD trade with with that trade that went down, that's another one of those LeBron things once he signed. It's like you kind of expect it coming, but there's also a lot of anticipation whether or not he's going to end up landing there or not. So um, AD signing, how was your reaction to that? Where were you at that time? I was actually at, I was at brunch with my wife and, and our brother and sister-in-law at this club in D.C. And um, it popped. I wasn't paying attention. I was like eating brunch, and my wife was like, "Look, look," because they had all these massive TVs up. And um, I looked up, and I'm like, "I can't believe they pulled this off." Like I, I thought they could. Like once the Pelicans brought in David Griffin, it was like, "Okay, I know he was going to go into this with like fresh, you know, fresh eyes and not have some of the baggage that the other people had." But my thing was, please just don't send him to Boston. Like, don't send him to Boston, right? And so. My wife is pointing at the screen and I'm like, oh my God. So I stand up, I start like fist pumping. Like we had just won the damn championship. I, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to curse. Just won the championship. And my sister-in-law is like, is he that good? And I'm like, yes, he's that good. Like he's top five that good. And with LeBron, these dudes can make it to the finals, like, and win the final. So I, I was just blown away that they got that deal done, man. Yeah. I, what's crazy to me about it is it's like, not even the craziest thing that happened that summer. You had Zion getting drafted to New Orleans. Like, they went from all the way to project at, like, the ninth pick to getting the first pick. 
you got the Lakers even getting the fourth pick, and then uh, Kawhi and P- the PG sneak trade to the Clippers. Mm-hmm. So many wild things happened that summer, but I, I mean, the Pelicans came out pretty good. They got a solid young yeah. core for the future. They're going to build up, and they even have a chance to make them to the A seed this year. But um, no, I remember the AD trade on uh, June 15th, though. I remember sitting there, seeing the signing happen, and I'm like, all right. I was like, I know what he's about, but like, let me uh, watch some clips to get me ready because we're not even in the we weren't in the playoffs that season. So I was like, mm-hmm. let me watch some AD clips and uh, get me ready for what we're about to see. And um, but I mean, it's crazy because so many uh, analysts and uh, ESPN and Fox all all put the Lakers like not even having a chance at making the playoffs. Some of them did. So. And I don't know if that's just because they're like, LeBron's expiring, LeBron's washed, which created the hashtag washed king. But um, your, what's your thoughts on uh, the ESPN BPI and everything that comes out in the Lakers reports um, saying they're going to go, uh, like just today they released 18% chance at winning the finals. What's your thoughts on all their BPIs and stats? So what's funny is, man, I've got like a bunch of videos on YouTube um, pointing out how wrong these guys are. And those videos are like my most watched videos when I point that stuff out because th- the truth is it's not really about being authentic. They're only saying that for really two reasons. One, it, whenever whenever you know major networks say something bad about the Lakers, Lakers fans get upset and then they retweet it. They, you know, they, they engage on social media. They watch it on TV, right? So you get like the Lakers fans engaging and then non-Lakers fans are like, yeah, the Lakers suck. So they start paying attention. So like the networks get best of both worlds when they put the Lakers down. So they're doing it for engagement and for views and for clicks. They're not really doing it for any other reason. Um, So I tell people like, look past that. Um, When I I think Colin Cowherd said the Lakers have lost their two best defenders in Avery Bradley and Rajon Rondo. And I'm like, you haven't watched any basketball all year long. Like clear, like Avery Bradley's a good defender. But yeah. Rajon Rondo hasn't played defense in like three years. Like, well, and another thing is with Rondo watching. going out, it was like, it was, I remember watching a lot of the games. It was always you've got him driving to the basket, and then he just goes back out to the corner and then passes it off. Like he didn't really make as many plays as you expect Rondo to make. So unless they think, hey, we're getting playoff Rondo for the first time in a while. They were way out of pocket, but um, go ahead and go on with what you're saying with that. No, I mean, they, they look, man, they're in the business of selling narratives. Like they're not really in the business of, of, of reporting what's actually going on on the court. And so Rondo has a lot of value. It's just that his value isn't so much on the court anymore. And so when they say things like the Lakers chances to win a championship goes down without Rondo, I'm like, yeah, okay. Like you guys aren't paying attention or when Skip Bayless tweets out how much trouble is LeBron in without Rondo. And I'm like, Rondo makes the game harder for these guys. And so, and this isn't a Rondo bash session. I'm, I'm just saying like when some of the guys um, at the beginning of the season, I did a video on um, some of the networks saying the Lakers wouldn't even be like top five in, in the NBA. Like when has LeBron not been top five? Has a LeBron team not been top five? I mean, last year, sure. Injuries and a young core, but LeBron and another all NBA player, like even if you didn't think they'd win the championship, they were at least one of the three or four best teams in NBA coming into the season. So like I saw people putting Portland ahead of them, Denver, Houston, and Philly. And I'm like, you guys aren't being honest. Like, this is crazy. You're just, you're just hating the hate. Yeah. And I like that you bring up, it's not a Rondo bash, which is obviously not, but but to add on to that, we watched what game was it? He uh, he was kind of coaching on the sideline. He always did that every time he injured. Mm-hmm. Every time he was injured, he was coaching on the sideline for the Thunder game. It was at OKC, and we ended up blowing him out by like thirty or something. Kuzma had like a thirty-two point night. Yeah, LeBron yep. had like twenty-six. It was an amazing game all around. And you, a lot of the clips you could tell like Rondo was uh, giving some, preaching a lot of good things on the sideline, but. I think it was you that tweeted out about yesterday when the injury came down. You said, uh, you said, um, Rondo is better as like, I, it may have been you. I may be wrong about this, but about Rondo is better as a sideline coach as a player at this point in his career, which mm-hmm. is completely true. But, yeah. um, yeah, 
Where do you, because I kind of want to, uh, a little bit about that. Where do you think Rondo is going to go after? Do you think he's going to go straight into coaching once he retires or no? Um, I, I mean, I can see that. I mean, even right now, right, he's injured, so he's going to be out six to eight weeks. So Frank Vogel said Rondo is going to participate in all of the coaches' Zoom calls, which makes sense. Like Rondo, Rondo doesn't have it anymore on the court. Like he can see the action on the court, but his body can't keep up. Like he's not an old man, but by basketball standards, he is. But he has a ton of knowledge. I mean, he's one of the smartest guys that in basketball. And so he, I think his value is, is, is coaching. The question is, you know, does he really want to go into that? He probably does at some point. Point guards usually do go into coaching in some capacity. And I do think that he's probably preparing himself to go into some, some form of coaching, whether it's at the collegiate or NBA level. Um, but he's got a lot of value, man. He's not a dumb player at all. Like, he's a very, very, very smart player. Yeah, he's well. We still saw where uh, that 2018-2019 season. The still how amazing he was when that he hit that game winner against the Celtics. Kicks out to about the free throw line, hits a fadeaway. He's got like three people on him. He shows the still competitive willingness. But as we watch, I mean, even you watch LeBron, you can tell where a little bit of like things are deteriorating. But he's still an amazing player. Still greatest player in the NBA right, right now. But you could still tell where, like, he's trying to reserve himself because he knows, I know my body can't handle this. Because you're about to go 40 years old in a couple of years. Like, three years from now, you're about to be 40. No 40-year-old's out there playing basketball at that high of a level. So he's trying to reserve himself as time goes on. And it's that same thing with Rondo. It's just he puts the effort out there, but his body can't move with it. But um, so I brought up a bit ago with the uh, ESPN BPI coming out saying, the Bucks had like a 50% chance, the Lakers 18%, um, Clippers 19%, and other teams. It was the uh, Celtics, Raptors, and uh, was the other one? No, it was Celtics and Raptors, yeah, 5% chance. So you and I both know, we both believe that the Lakers are going to win it all, but what do you think it's going to take to beat a team like the Bucks and a team like the uh, Clippers? Look, man, look, it, it, it always takes – you want to be injury-free. You want to be clicking whenever they, whenever they meet and whatever these bubble playoffs are going to look like or bubble finals if it's against the Bucs. I mean, here's the thing, man. Would I be surprised if the Bucs or Clippers won the championship? No, because they are very good teams. Like, this is really a three-horse race. Now, there are some people that think the Bucs could lose to the Raptors, and I think that's also possible. I always remind people of this. When the Bucs beat us earlier in the season – Anthony Davis shot five of eight from three-point land. That is Anthony – I mean, I'm sorry, that was Giannis. Giannis shot five of eight. That's Giannis's best three-point shooting game ever. Like, if, if it's going to take Giannis shooting, hitting five threes to beat us, I'll take that any day of the week. You saw what happened when, when the Lakers played the Bucks and Clippers in back-to-back -back games. LeBron outplayed Kawhi and Giannis combined, right? So the Lakers can certainly beat them. It's not going to be easy. Like I'm not, they're not going to sweep them, but the Lakers have the tools, and they they've I I think they've addressed some of their issues. Like for example, Deion Waiters, they've got another guy that can get his own shot. We haven't seen him play since his time in Miami, which was almost a year ago. But I think he does add something to the team. J.R. Smith, he he comes off ball screens, he can shoot threes, he spaces the floor. Those are things that Rondo and Avery Bradley couldn't do. They couldn't create their own shot, and they didn't come off of screens and space the floor. So the Lakers have a different dynamic now. Um, but it, as long as you've got LeBron and Anthony Davis and they're healthy, I'll take them against anybody. Yeah, I, LeBron and AD are an amazing duo. And what, what you mentioned is LeBron kind of being able to hold them and captivate them on defense with between Kawhi and Giannis. And I was Giannis shot like two for nine against LeBron. LeBron – drop was like five for 11 against Giannis. So obviously the statistics prove that LeBron was better in that game against Giannis. And we even watched, I think one of my favorite moments of the season, I retweeted this the other day was um, the LeBron and Giannis matchup uh, where LeBron took him one-on-one -on -one to the basket against the, uh, where it was at the uh, Lakers home game mm -hmm. right before the season ended. And I remember seeing all the crowd get up on their feet in that game. Everybody, uh, whistling hollering for it it was just like the excitement felt like oh yeah the playoffs are on their way it, it kind of reminded me of one of those kobe moments in his final game where 
he dropped 60 points in there and was fading away, hitting nice threes against the Jazz and hit those tying or hit those game winning free throws at the end about like 40 seconds left or so. So it kind of had that like momentum to it where it kind of felt like the Lakers are about to go on a roll here and they went on that roll against the Clippers beating about 7 that game. And one of the things I've noticed is the doubt is like it's always the the Clippers are the best team in LA. Uh Kawhi is the king of LA. It's like you can't just give this guy a new nickname because you don't like LeBron, but um it's <laughs> I think to beat the Bucks in my own opinion and beat the Clippers was Avery Bradley was kind of that key guy, which it's going to take a big toll on us because we saw Avery Bradley was amazing against the Clippers that game. The Bucks wasn't as an astounding of a game, but he still played great. But against the Clippers, he had like 19, I believe, and was doing everything from the three-point land. He was showing that team like, all right, the Lake Show's here. Like, this is time for us to win. Mm-hmm. But um, I love that you brought up J.R. Smith before that. Um, you, we lose Avery Bradley uh, due to the uh, bubble. He doesn't want to play because of his son's health, so he mm-hmm. takes it out. Now we get J.R. Smith uh, to finish out the season for us. Then we lose Rondo. But what, what do you think the upside and downside is of uh, J.R. coming to the Lakers and joining the Lake show? So there's no downside. Let me say this, man. The Lakers have done a great job this season with taking players that the rest of the league laughed at, and they've been great. Dwight Howard, nobody else won it. He's been great this year. They went and they, they brought in Deion Waiters. Nobody won it. We haven't seen him yet, but I think he'll be fine. Like, you look at JR, and I know there's that meme going around from when he, you know, screwed up the finals, you know, three or four years ago. JR does not want his career to end with a meme, right? Like, who would want their career to end that way? So I think JR is going to be motivated. I don't think the Lakers would have brought him in if he wasn't. Um, I think it's all upside. Like he doesn't play defense like Avery Bradley did. So he's not going to replace what Avery Bradley brought, but he brings something different in that he can space the floor. He's still pretty athletic. I mean, he's, you know, he's 34 years old. He's not as athletic as he used to be, but like the dude can still play. And he's, he's not asked to play 40 minutes. If he, if he's asked to come in and play 10 or 15 minutes and space the floor. One thing we know about Dion waiters and J.R. Smith, they are not afraid to take a big shot. Right. And, and LeBron's not afraid to pass the ball to someone that, to take a big shot. So I want guys like that on my team. And so when I look at who was available, if, if he was the best available, then I'm, I'm okay with that. I really like him a lot. And I think, I think he's going to come up in, in big moments because he can get hot really quick. Him and Dion, they can, they can score in bunches. And I think we're going to need that. Yeah, I, I think uh, this is going to be a really far take here. It's going to be a really hot take. But in my opinion, J.R. Smith is – probably the best three-point shooter we have on the Lakers. Now, Danny Green last season would obviously been the better shooter, but from watching him this season, it feels like he's so inconsistent as the season goes on, as time goes on. But it may prove me wrong that once the playoffs hit that he's our best three-point shooter out there as well. But, um, no, I think J.R. Smith, his shot creation is what also helps that because we saw how well he can create shots whenever he was in his prime, and you don't lose that touch whenever you go out of prime it becomes a little bit weaker and it becomes a little bit less as strong, but you still understand how to get to that shot and how to get open on there. So I think that's going to be great for the Lakers because a lot of times we saw where LeBron kind of like wants to slow down the play and then whenever it's in a tight game, trying to find the open spot. But now that you're going to have a guy like J.R. Smith in there, because AD, he's a great post-up and uh, hitting the fadeaway on the post-up. But um, LeBron, he's a great finisher. He even hit a few fadeaways this season. But you kind of need that guy that can kind of go like baseline and hit the shot whenever you need him to, kind of like what we saw with the Rondo shot against the Celtics. You're always going to need that shot in there. And I think J.R. Smith is the go-to guy for that shot with this Lakers team. But a little bit about the playoffs ahead. We got uh, a seed like the uh, possible Trailblazers making it in there. You've got possible the uh, Pelicans and Zion coming in there, even a team like um, the Grizzlies, which they're the front runners. So who do you see coming in for that A spot? Grizzlies, Pelicans, or uh, any other team, honestly? I think it's Portland. I think the NBA wants it to be the Pelicans. Um, Pelicans have the easiest road to make it to the eighth seed. And obviously the NBA will make a lot of money if you get a LeBron and Zion matchup, if you will. Um, But, 
I think it'll be Portland. Uh, if the Pelicans happen to sneak in, they're going to get swept. I mean, it's just young teams don't do well in the playoffs. This is an unprecedented playoff run this this season with the bubble. Um, but I think it's Portland. I, 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 Dame is playing. I know there was some talk that he may not have played, but he, he's playing. I think Portland gets in. Yeah, one of the – that's my thought is it's going to be definitely – in my feelings, it's going to be either between the Pelicans or the Trailblazers. I really want to say the Grizzlies, but out of being a fan of the NBA, I really want it to be those two teams. So, But seeing the outcome of the uh, Trailblazers, I'm praying every night. I'm, I, I prayed last night. I was like, Lord, please don't let Dame Lord uh, hit another shot like he hit against the Thunder to win the game. Like That's my thought every day is if the Trailblazers go in there, uh, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a challenge, but even though they had good games, they won by twenty one game, the Kobe game, uh, the first game we played after Kobe's mm-hmm. death, that we lost, they lost that about by eight. But it's also team still trying to reconcile after yeah. trying to grieve after Kobe's loss, and even those fa- uh, few games after that, they still struggled. But you could tell the emotion was like kind of there, mm-hmm. like the sadness and the grieving, but um. It was uh, definitely the Trailblazers, the top scariest threat. And then, but one team I definitely worry about as well is uh, a team like the Spurs. Now, if, I think they did lose LaMarcus Aldridge, though, right? I believe so, yes. Defensively, the Spurs have proven to be great. So, but even though their offense is, is there, that's one thing I worry about is defensive wise, it's going to be a struggle against the Spurs. But, um, Heading in farther into the playoffs, where do you see the Lakers struggling? Like against a team like the Rockets, how do you see the Lakers performing? Yeah, I mean, the last time we saw the Rockets, like they had basically gotten rid of every center on their team and was running a PJ Tucker at the five. So, I, I the first time we played them and they did that, that was a shock because we had never seen it. But now we've seen it. Um, I think the Rockets can get hot because they've got James Harden and Russell Westbrook, and they just shoot a bunch of threes, but. They could be a problem. I think Denver could be a problem. Um, I'd say probably Denver, outside of the Clippers, obviously, but I think like Denver or or um, you know, Portland could – Dame could get hot, like you mentioned. I mean, Dame and CJ, if they get hot, they can get rolling. But I, I'd say Houston, they could be a problem um, if they get rolling. But I, I don't trust anybody that, that has a 6'5 guy playing center. I mean, that's just – I don't believe in that, man. Yeah, I remember waking up that morning checking Twitter because with being on the East Coast, I know you probably struggle with this too. It's hard to stay up for those games whenever with me, I've got school every morning. And then with you, I'm sure you've got work or something to do. So like you're just waking up that morning. You're like, all right, let's hope we won this game. And uh, I remember checking that first morning they played once they got rid of Clint. And it was like, oh, wow, we uh, we just lost against the Rockets. And that was kind of wild. But they're uh, they're probably gonna. It's like the uh, twenty seven miss threes game. It's it's gonna be very a three point reliable team. Mm-hmm. But um, real quick, we have very short time here. So heading into the bubble, we've already heard a lot of snitches. Uh, heard stories about the snitching going on. Where do you see the? Uh, how far do you see the bubble uh, going before everyone uh, starts getting kind of ratted out? Because there's already been like a couple of players that's been sitting out. Who do you think? Uh, or what do you think is uh, going to be stronger on protocols? How do you think things are going to go down? I, I mean, look, the coronavirus is nothing to play with, man. So I, the NBA has to crack down on players if they're you know, sneaking outside or sneaking people in. Um, they, they set that hotline up for that specific reason. And uh, I think that I can't recall which player, but a player already kind of accidentally stepped outside of it to get fast food or something. The last thing the NBA wants is there to be like a breakout within the bubble because that that would be terrible um not just for the players but other personnel family other pe- disney workers and so they have to take it seriously and if you not if you're not going to take it seriously then you have no business being in disney world so um i would imagine that if anybody you know tries to quote unquote break the rules um someone's going to snitch um and that's okay like i like this is a life or death thing and you don't need someone g- getting sick and then getting everybody else sick you don't you don't need that yeah. So uh, we're about to call it quits here and end it here, but uh, I really appreciate you for coming on. It's nice to be able to talk some Lakers and uh, kind of go off interviewing for a bit. So I th- thank you for coming on, man. Yeah, you're welcome.
Um, but yeah, if you guys want to check out Lakers Central, you check it out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, on Instagram, Lakers Central 365, even on Twitter. Um, they're a great page, great podcast. Be sure to check them out. And uh, we'll see you guys next time on the shot clock uh, with a great episode ahead. See you guys.